Why, well, if, if, you don't, if you don't know any, how do you know you don't like them? <laughs> Just see them on the TV fight and the battles and all. That's all I know about them. I don't want to know about them. Do any Catholics at your school know? No. No, they all go to their own schools? Yes. If you met a little boy and you liked him and you suddenly discovered he was a Catholic, what would you do? Go away from him again. Why would you do that? Because he's a Catholic. The very center of the Roman Catholic faith is the doctrine of the mass. Well, what is the mass? The Romanists go to the mass. The priest says he has priestly power to offer the sacrifice of the mass. Mass at every function that the Roman Catholic Church has, it has this mass ceremony. That's the central, central doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, what is the mass? Well, at the Mass, the priest takes the wafer. It is round. It's made round purposely, for it comes from Babylonian idolatry. It's the old offering of pancakes to the Queen of Heaven, taken out of idolatry and brought into Romanism and made the central place of their worship. And the priest, when he holds up this wafer, and when he dedicates this wafer, he says that he turns it, listen, into the body, bones, blood, nerves, sinews, and deity of Christ. And the Romanist kneels at the altar, and the priest says to him, put out your tongue. And the priest puts what he says is Jesus Christ on the tongue of the person receiving a wafer. And the person receiving a wafer is warned, don't put your teeth through it, for that's your God. And you have not to chew your God. You're just allowed to let them melt away on the roof of your mouth. There was a time when everybody was against Ulster, but the men that ran in the guns at Larne, they knew how to stand upon their feet. And only for them we would have no liberty or no Union Jack flying over us today. And let me say that on this anniversary of the Battle of the Somme, we paid tribute to those who fought and died to keep Ulster free. And by the grace of God, Ulster shall remain free, no matter what quarters the attacks may come from. And Mr. Harold Wilson, the British Prime Minister, he has called you folks that are here today, and myself in particular, as quasi-fascists. Let me remind them, it was the men of Ulster that kept this part of Ireland open for British troops during the war. And the fascists were in the south of Ireland, and De Valera and Sean Lamass, the friend of Harold Wilson, were in fact the allies of the fascist leader Hitler and his colleague Mussolini. So if he wants to know where the fascists are, he will find them with his friend Cardinal Heening. For Cardinal Heening and the Prime Minister are very close, and I'll tell you why. Because the constituency that Harold Wilson represents is overwhelmingly Roman Catholic. And he would not be a Labour MP today, except he was voted in by the Roman Catholic vote in his own constituency. And the final word, there's an exhortation here to resistance. What am I to do today? When the battle's on, when Protestantism is labeled fascism, and those that stand for God, God are called sordid gangsters. And when every avenue of propaganda is loaded against those that stand for Reformation principles, what shall I do? God says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Make sure that you are standing in Christ, and then stand fast in the glorious liberty of your
Protestantism. These are bitter days, you know. The Prime Minister has made some awful statements, and he's trying to gather the evidence to prove them. One of my members' homes were visited by officers of the special branch. Said to this man who's a Christian, and as an orange man, they said, you have arms in your house. Well, the man had arms in his body, all right, but he hadn't arms in the house. And they said, you go to Paisley's parade, and the boot of your car is filled with revolver. A powerful statement to me. But they were asked to prove it, and they couldn't prove it. And if they had been so confident that this man had arms, it's a strange thing that they didn't go on there to rifle his house, but they didn't do it after talking for two hours to him. Now, I want to warn every Protestant in this congregation, you guard your property well. Keep your eye on I'm looking after my property, and dear help anybody that tries to plant ever anything in my home or in the premises that I control. They'll be in real trouble. And I want to say that. We have got to guard our property. It's important. And by that I mean to see. Lest these cameramen, I heard them switching off there, I have good ears, lest they don't get this straight. I'm meaning that the, our homes are to be guarded in the sense that we have to see that no one plants anything in our home. Things are not hidden. Coming from London to another part of the United Kingdom, it is something of a shock to see the members of the Royal Ulster Constabulary toting revolvers and sometimes submachine guns. Constant threats are made against members of the government. Brian McConnell, the Minister for Home Affairs, is guarded night and day. I asked him how seriously Ian Paisley should be regarded as a political force. I think that uh, one has got to deplore any heightening of passions or, or, or of tensions. I, I think that it's very much uh, a minority of people that are influenced by this kind of thing. But everyone can express his political opinion in this country as the other parts of the United Kingdom without letter or hindrance. Just as you have various people in Trafalgar Square giving opinions that are not generally accepted, so we have uh, people here. One of your fellow unionists has referred to uh, Dr. Paisley as a bloated bullfrog. Would you agree with that description? Oh, I, I'm not, I don't habitually use such picturesque language. Um, do you think that his movement, however, is growing in strength? I don't really think it is. Jerry Fitt, your Republican Labour MP for Belfast West, a member of the Stormont, and a member of Belfast City Council. Do you think that uh, Paisley should be taken seriously? Paisley should be taken, taken very, very seriously. You see, in Northern Ireland, whilst I do not agree, I am bitterly opposed to everything for which Mr. Paisley stands, I can understand his chagrin and his disappointment at the Unionist Party. Because the Unionist Party have constantly sought and gratefully accepted Mr. Paisley's help and his supporters' help during elections. Mr. Paisley must feel somewhat disappointed now to feel that he is cast aside by the Unionist Party, his former friends. Because make no mistake about this, the biggest crime that Paisley has committed, the cardinal sin which he has committed, is by saying in public what a lot of other Unionists think in private. He says it in a rather hostile, uncouth manner, but there are many, many supporters, many, many unionists who believe in everything for which, which Mr. Paisley stands for. It's been said that his support is at least 200,000 people in Ulster. Do you think that that's a fair estimate? I certainly do. You see, at the moment, I believe that Mr. Paisley has succeeded in suborning the Orange Order. The unionist state of Northern Ireland and the six counties was brought about with the help of the Orange Order. It is the foundation on which the partition of Ireland exists. At the moment, the Orange Order is made up of many individuals. 50% of them would support Paisley. The other 50% would support the O'Neill administration in Northern Ireland. But if at any time there was a doubt in the mind of those who at present support the government that their position was not as secure as it should be, the possibility that they may lose their jobs, that gerrymandering and dairy would stop, they then, 
And this is the danger. They could certainly throw in their wit with the Paisley element, which would lead to a change of government in Northern Ireland. Martin Wallace, your deputy editor of the Belfast Telegraph, how seriously do you regard Paisley and his movement? Uh, not, not as seriously as many of the people who have come into Northern Ireland recently. I think because uh, I've been here too long and I've lived with it too long, and I think mainly because he appears not to have any responsible support. The leaders of the political, the clerical leaders of the community, the responsible business leaders of the community, he seems to me to have no support in any of these quarters. Seems to me, though, to have an awful lot of support among ordinary people in the streets. Uh, can you explain to me the basis of this support? Yes, I think so. I think there are two reasons. Um, first of all, the ecumenical movement, I think. Secondly, the uh, meetings between uh, Prime Minister O'Neill here and Mr. Lamas in the Republic. Uh, people, the, the, the sort of ground root support of uh, the Unionist Party, of Protestant here, Protestantism here, is, I think, uh, rooted in anti-Catholicism, a fear of Rome, a fear perhaps of being absorbed in uh, an Irish Catholic state. Now, in addition, Paisley has had this uh, celebration in the north of the Easter, of the 1916 Easter Rising. Now, a lot of people in the north have resented the fact of this being celebrated here. A lot of Protestants haven't liked this. This coupled with the uh, celebration also this year of the Battle of the Somme, at which a great many Ulster people died. So Paisley has had a lot of things working in his favour uh, at the moment. I think uh, O'Neill, Prime Minister O'Neill here, is trying to create a modern industrial society, but in doing so, he is asking for changes which a lot of the community find are coming too quickly. Mm -hmm. This is a question of speed. Whatever politicians and responsible citizens may think, the fact is that in the crowded slums of Belfast, Paisley is a hero to be received as heroes should be. In Ulster, so far as Paisley is concerned, there are no neutralists. What do you think of Ian Paisley? Well, I think he's a good man. He has to brighten us all up. Brighten you up? Oh. Well, I'm a Catholic myself here, and uh, I think Ian Paisley is... He's not a clergyman by any degree. But the way he preaches hatred, bitterness, it's not Christianity at all. After all, we're all Christians. We all intend to meet our maker and get to heaven. But for to preach bitterness and hatred, that's the work of the devil. I don't think much of him. Why not? Because he's only a troublemaker, that's all he is. Creating trouble. I think he's very good. Why? Yes, well, he's preaching the gospel all the time, and he's up against the Roman Catholics and Senators. What do you think of he's him? Uh, why do you think he's a good man? Well, it's, I couldn't tell you. He has saved my two sons. In what way did he save your sons? Well, they went to the meeting and they just went into the hall and they heard him preaching and they just went into the room with him. I see. What did he save them from? Oh, well... One went to dances and one went to bookies. I see. And you think that's evil, do you? I think it is very evil. Well, he has some good points. I wouldn't go all the way with Mr. Paisley. There are some very, very good points. He stands up for what he thinks is right insofar as uh, our religious beliefs are concerned. But uh, my belief is that uh, as a minister of the gospel, I think he should confine himself to the scriptures, and if he has to bring politics into it, it's either one or the other, discard it the collar, or be a politician. Isn't it really true, though, that Dr. Paisley is only really saying what other unionist leaders and politicians and religious leaders in this country have been saying for 40 years? They may not have been saying it the last two or three years, but they said it in the past. Yes, I think they haven't said it as strongly, they haven't demonstrated in quite the same way. On the other hand, he is expressing a uh, reservations which are felt by a great many uh, Protestants and I think some of his strength is that people feel that he is the only one who is expressing these sort of reservations. I think the Unionist Party here has a lot to answer for. It has failed in the job of political education. It has failed to prepare people for the sort of changes which must occur in Ulster. Do you think it's prepared now to start educating them? Well, it's a slow process, you know, uh, 
O'Neill is giving, I think, a very good leadership. I don't think he's being as well supported within the party as he should be. The whole structure of the Orange Lodges seems to me to work in Paisley's favour. I mean, isn't it an awful long time after the Battle of the Boyne to be marching in the streets and to be putting slogans on the wall about King Billy? I suppose this is true. On the other hand, I think the, the Orange Order enjoys now a very good, responsible leadership. It has taken a very responsible position, for example, uh, during the period of the Easter Rising celebrations. It has not been provocative in recent time. Uh, I think there are a lot of individual Orangemen at, at, at a grassroots level who obviously support Paisley. But I think with responsible leadership, such as the Order has, it, it's a force for good at the moment. But Paisley is invited along to speak from Orange platforms, I mean, by the branches themselves. Well, this is true. This is a battle that the Orange Order is going to have to fight out internally. There's no mm. question of this. Yeah. The, the Orange institution is a religious institution. It encourages the, the practice of religion amongst its members, and it teaches tolerance towards the, the Roman Catholic members of the community. And I think that anyone who is a good Orangeman is an asset to a community, and an asset towards bringing the community together. Mr. McConnell, I've been at the opening of several arches in this town, orange arches. I've been at meetings in the country. I've heard precious little uh, tolerance towards Catholics at those meetings. Well, I, I could take you to plenty where it's expressed. Perhaps you uh, chose the ones that, where there were people there that weren't likely to express it. Uh, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Paisley refers to the Prime Minister as a traitor, and presumably the members oh. of his government as traitors. Do you consider yourself a traitor to the Protestant cause? No, I don't. And incidentally, Mr. Paisley is not an Orangeman. Hmm. Although he, but he's invited to Orange platforms. Oh, well, I mean, uh, an Orange Lodge can invite anyone they'd like along to the platform. The houses have been painted in red, white and blue. The arches have been erected and decorated with loving care by the Orange Street Committees. Soon the matches will be set to the July 12th bonfires. Ulster waits uneasily. Mr. McConnell, do you think the situation in Ireland is going to get better or worse? Oh, I think it'll get better. In fact, I'm sure that we're a, a progressive community and we'll continue to progress. And I don't think the odd bubble like this is going to make any difference to the ultimate progress of this country. Mr. Fitt, if it came to a showdown now between uh, Paisley and, and Captain O'Neill, the Prime Minister, who do you think would win? At the moment, I think all the sayings are that Paisley has received an awful lot of support all over Northern Ireland. You see, as I've already said, the Orange Order seems to have been suborned. The more uncouth, hostile elements in this particular order are supporting Paisley. A decent, respectable crowd seem to be supporting the Prime Minister. But if Paisley is able to convince them that their jobs or livelihood can in any way be placed in jeopardy by uh, coming together in an ecumenical movement, the breaking down of barriers, then I have no doubt to preserve their own privileged class, they would certainly throw their weight in with Paisley. It sounds then, Mr. Fitz, as if you look at the future with some foreboding. I believe, and I hope I'm proved wrong, but I believe that we are in for a long, hot summer. <laughs> Oh, my God.